All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'm here to tell you that I think you need to test your data. So a little bit about me, just to get warmed up. According to my buddy at Caltech, I'm from that other institute of technology, and I just finished my fourth year of grad school. During my day-to-day -day work, I play with statistics and biological, biological data, specifically sequencing data, and I think you need to test your data. So why do you need to test your data? Well, if you're like me, and you've got data on your hands, and you need to analyze it, you are going to have assumptions about your data. You will also make transformations on your data. And in, the turn, in turn, you will also be making more assumptions about your data. And the kicker is, the data don't always follow your assumptions. So let me give you an example of what I mean by assumptions about your data. Let's say you have one column in your data file that needs to be log 10 transformed. Within 10 seconds, can somebody shout out what assumptions you've made about that data? Positive integer. No zeros. It's numeric. Very good. All right. One other thing you might also assume is that that data, that log 10 column, already doesn't, doesn't already exist inside the data file. So you might want to write some tests to make sure these assumptions are correct. So how do you do it? It's very simple. Step one, grab PyTest. If you haven't got it, it's pretty awesome. Step two, create your test script, right? That's how you do it. I learned, I learned this command line, command line stuff about two weeks ago when I sort of gave, that, gave this lightning talk in other settings. So command line's awesome as well. Third thing you want to do is start writing your test script. Make your test script read your data. Fourth thing you do is write assertion statements, which we all know is how testing is done. And finally, you run your tests. All right, so let me give you a quick example of what I mean by this. And this is born out of my own research as well. I have a test script. It's called test underscore data dot pi. It's placed in the same folder as I've got my data files. I have my import statements. I have my reading of the data. And then I have 27 test functions that I've written and accumulated over time. The only other thing I need to do is go into that directory, CD in there, Fire up pi.test, hit go, roughly about five seconds later, bam, they all passed. Yay. And if your data test failed, scream at your data provider. Actually, no, talk nicely with them. Figure out what's wrong with that. Uh, write, rerun your tests, make sure they're OK. Rinse and repeat, you'll never have enough data tests. So what are the benefits of doing these data tests? One, you will have a permanent record inside, well, permanent as long as you don't change it and you version control it with Git, you will have a permanent record of what your data should look like. Two, you will enforce sanity checks on your data. And three, if your data source ever has to change, you've still got that original test set, which encoded all of the assumptions you were making about that data, which you can then test against the new data. And so I'd like to leave everybody with a mantra. Please repeat after me. Test all the data. Thank you very much. I wasn't going to use slides anyway. So uh, I'm Mike Zingali. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at Stony Brook. And any of you who teach know what a pain textbooks are. Students hate them too. They hate pain for them. Um, especially if you teach graduate classes, we often craft our own sort of notes. And the obvious thing one might think about is sharing them and using the tools that we have here uh, that we use in this community. And that is why not put everything up on GitHub, allow people to contribute to your text via pull requests, allow people to make mashups and so forth. And so I created a GitHub organization called Open Astrophysics Bookshelf, Open-Astrophysics Bookshelf. That's the only thing I would have needed a slide for. Uh, if you go to that, you'll see that there are some texts up there. I have the notes for my uh, introduction to computational hydrodynamics, which is my research field. There's a text from Mark Krumholz now at Australia on um, star formation. It's about 300 pages. There's a text from Ed Brown at MSU on stars, about 200 pages or so. And this is something we just started, but uh, I think it's something that can go across fields. Why not share your stuff, Creative Commons, 
LaTeX is perfectly gettable, and that's what we use in our field. And then anyone can contribute to it. There's talk of doing a, a 101 level book and sort of crowdsourcing these things. And there's talk and sort of a stub of a scientific computing uh, text up there as well. So check out the URL if you're interested. Contribute. Uh, you know, spelling, grammar, chapters, whole other text, whatever you want to do. I think it's an easy way for us to just share our knowledge and not have to worry about pricey textbooks, which, again, if you teach, you know, on both ends for students and faculty, it can be a pain. Yes? What is the address? Open-astrophysics-bookshelf. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, okay, I'll tweet that later. It's on, see that red poster that's on the fabric? It's my first fabric poster because I didn't feel like carrying a tube around. There's a URL in the bottom corner of it as well. Anyway, uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting and useful and there's no reason you can't do it in whatever fields you guys play in as well. Well, until you come up here, I'm telling jokes. So have you all heard the one about the uh, corduroy pillows? They're making headlines. Okay. Have you all heard the one about simple? It's a new programming language. It stands for the Sheer Idiots Monopurpose Programming Language Environment. The language was developed to make it impossible to write code with errors in it. Therefore, the statements are limited to just begin, end, and stop. And no matter how you arrange these statements, you can't make a syntax error. Unfortunately, programs written in simple do nothing useful. Thus, they achieve the results of programs written in other languages without the tedious, frustrating process of testing and debugging. <laughs> you, ready? you ready to go? I got, I got more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so those of you who have internet, if you go to matplotlib.org slash cycler, C-Y-C-L-E-R. Cycler? matpolub.org slash C-Y-C-L-E-R. Right? Has at least a subset of people found it? Okay. So this is a little utility. Uh, we were thinking about how to do cycles over multiple styles in Matplotlib. Uh, and we, end, and we ended up writing this little utility that provides uh, composable cycles. So you can define a cycler which has a label and then a sequence of values to loop through. Uh, and these things are composable. So if you take two cycles and add them together with the plus sign, if they're the same length, you get uh, an iterate over it, you get out dictionaries which are the key value pairs of those two. If you then multiply any of these two things together, you get the outer product. So now if you have some complex combination of color, line cycle, mark every, you know, alpha, whatever you want, you can have very quickly build up an iterator that will yield uh, dictionaries uh, that can then be passed into plotting functions, uh, uh, star star quarks, and you can cycle however you want. So, and yeah, and if you're if you're looking at the docs, you can see this all explained with you know code. So that was not really my lightning talk, but because we need to fill in the blanks. Huh? Um, I want to say that Python 3.5 is awesome. You should try it. You have a lot of nice things in it. Um, Ubuntu wants to try to make it the default uh, for the next long-term release, so please test your library with Python 3.5. Uh, you have in particular the run uh, command in some process that one of our chairman had into IPython, uh, Python uh, 3.5, uh, which is uh, really nice because it wraps a check call and, and everything. And for those of you who are using GitHub and want to just change that in Travis to test, you can just test on 3.5 by replacing uh, by on the list of Python. You test on had the nightly string, and then suddenly your library will be uh, tested on, on 3.5. And we have some crucial libraries that don't work on 3.5 yet, like PyTest, by, by because by, uh, CPython changed the structure of the AST uh, a few weeks back, if I remember correctly. And like even people like Guido don't have their tests at pass. We know that Guido don't need testing, but. Uh, <laughs> so please uh, try your, your library on 3.5. Um, it's just one line if you're using Travis, and you have a lot of awesome feature. Uh, 
it's just uh, easily installable. You don't have to clone master. You have beta already out now. So 3.5 is a present. No, that present version is fairly old. It has at least one known password that breaks things from my it, it, it's, still, it's, it's still better than nothing, and it's just one line. <laughs> Okay, so here's what we're going to do instead of lightning talks until we get the screens fixed. So we're going to do one of my favorite things, which are rants. So if anyone has a rant of any kind on any topic and wants to come up for a short period of time, please, uh, please do. I know these, the, ah, there we are, one, one there. We've got a winner. All right, and maybe just form a line if there's enough ranters. <laughs> I feel like there's going to be need for a line, so um, yeah. All right, so that I think is fair. You can disagree, but all right. You can rant about it. Yeah, right, you can rant about it. <laughs> I'm actually just going to take this opportunity um, to perform opposite action, which <laughs> is a skill I'm learning in therapy, and it's <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to do the opposite thing from like whatever it is you really strongly don't want to do. You force yourself to do it. <laughs> um, so giving talks is a good good thing to practice. Um, so a lot of us love statistics and um, optimization. Um, I studied risk assessment, and I was really excited to go like, oh, cool! I'm going to be able to like find these nuanced details. But it's good to remind ourselves of some basic statistics. So could I have like everyone, I just want to do like a data visualization really quick. Could I have everyone that's like past this line stand up? Just like just past there. Okay, cool. Um, all right, <laughs> sorry. Um, that's maybe a little bit more, but um, all of these people are representing um, the number of us who have experienced a diagnosable mental illness in the last year. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, the other thing with risk assessment, you can you can sit down. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I was really excited. I was like, I'm going to find out all these details, um, and like I'll be able to like avert disaster at all times. Um, and then I realized, like, oh, actually, like the person who's most likely to murder myself would be me, which is kind of terrifying if you think about that. Um, <laughs> that statistically speaking you are the most likely to murder yourself. And so we don't take these things necessarily quite seriously. We, we don't really think about um, some of the simple statistics out there that could affect how we move forward with life. So another exercise I want you guys to do is just could everyone put your feet flat on the floor? OK, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then I'm just going to have you breathe in from your nose and then breathe out from your mouth, like a very deep breath. So in through your nose. Okay, we just all took one beautiful breath together. And I want to remind you there are like skills that we can implement to kind of like, we have all these modules that's really exciting. Um, and I, I'm like always inspired at conferences like this. I'm like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to be the most productive programmer ever. Um, but there's also other things that impact like living a fulfilling life and being the best programmer that you can be. Um, so I encourage you to meditate and be compassionate. And that's all. I'm going to try and be a little more ranty. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is about what Git can teach scientists to make you more reproducible. And there's two lessons here. First, every important object should have two identifiers, minimum. A human-friendly identifier that could potentially change. And that's what you use when you're talking to human beings about a sample or a file. And a machine-friendly identifier that is globally unique and never changes. If it's for a sample, it could be a UUID. And it could be something else for a file. The other part that Git teaches us is that what is a file? It's not a path. It's not a name. It's not a URL. That's like saying that you are your home address or you are your GPS coordinates. A file is a finite sequence of bytes. That's why it makes sense to say that I copied my file to Amazon. See, I'm getting ranty now. <laughs> Therefore, the identifier for a file that would be unique 
and immutable should be intrinsic to the file. It should be the cryptographic hash of the file. The MD5, the SHA-1, I don't really care. It's interesting to note that the MD5 is eight times more unique than a UUID is, because three bits of the UUID are used for algorithm and they're the same number of bits. So please, 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 when you're creating a freeze list for your project, and say you, in column A, you have sample name, and in column B, you have a human-friendly file name, in column C, put the checksum there. <laughs> Okay, so Werner Heisenberg, Kurt Gödel, and Noam Chomsky walk into a bar. <laughs> I will tell that joke if you want, but I do have a rant. I was at Julia Khan two weeks ago, and this is not a rant about Julia, but it's about something that I saw that I thought was a little shocking. They had all sorts of benchmarks throughout every presentation. And one of the pitches for Julia, which is a fantastic language and a fantastic project, sponsored by NumFocus, um, <laughs> is that they have a lot of benchmarks that show it being a thousand times faster or 400 times faster or very large multiples faster than any other language in production for one task or another. And you could think that a benchmark showing a hundred times faster, a thousand times faster, in our experience in general, you know, these get whittled down a little bit, but it's still meaningful. But there are a couple of benchmarks and a couple of presentations where they said, oh, you should write your code this way. If you do it in the Fortran 90 style, it can be 5% slower than if you do it in the explicit looping style. And I thought, this is an audience full of statisticians showing all sorts of numbers, and there's no model. And I tried to think how many times I've ever seen a benchmark where somebody gave the model associated with the benchmark. And I thought, I've never seen a benchmark that talked about p-values or confidence intervals. I've never heard anybody talk about a frequentist or Bayesian approach to benchmarks. And I thought, probably the whole field of benchmarking is bunk. Anything, <laughs> anything below like 20% difference, there's no, there's no theory behind it to show that it's anything but noise, right? There's no model of the, comp of the computer. And every time I look really closely, if, you, if you're on Stack Overflow a lot, especially if you read through the C++ questions, you'll see somebody come up with some question and they'll say, why is this code faster? And I think it's a little preposterous to write code and to not know why it's faster than code that you wrote in another fashion, but that's a C++ issue. <laughs> this is a very broad rant. <laughs> Instead, I thought, when you really look closely, it seems like the explanations for why one thing is faster than the other, it comes down to cache and branch misprediction. And then it doesn't seem like there's any other answer to anything else. And I very, very briefly studied chemistry when I was in school, and it reminded me of our go-to answer for every chemistry exam, which was Van der Waal or, I think, hydrogen bonding. And it seemed like there were two answers and it applied to like half of the, the, half of the questions that people asked, but there was no model, there was no rigor, there was no analysis of, can I say predictably if this code is faster than that? And I think this is horrible and I think that most benchmarks are just absolute fluff, they're good marketing, and maybe they capture some attention, but it's horrible. And I have two minutes left, so I'll tell the joke. <laughs> so, Heisenberg looks around, and he says, because there are three of us, and because this is a bar, then this must be a joke. But the question remains, is it funny or not? Gödel thinks for a bit and says, yes, but because we're inside the joke, we can't tell if it's funny. <laughs> Chomsky looks at the two of them and says, of course it's funny, you're just telling it wrong. <laughs> there you go. So here this week and, you know, looking around what people are doing on the net, I see people using the multiprocessing module and I've yet to figure it out. Like, it's a piece of crap. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work at all. Like, it, it has this, this beautiful declarative API looking like threading API, but there, there's no real way to do that without, you know, in a, in a general way, the way that it loads its code. So it forks without execing here, which screwed over someone in this last session in this room where, uh, you know, NumPy compiled against some blasts, but not others worked. So why you don't fork without executing kids unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, but then it doesn't if you're using a manager or, oh, let's add a flag or, or if you're on Windows. And so I don't, 
I don't know why people are still using it. You know, it has this network layer that just, oh, an exception comes? Am I going to figure out how much of my message I sent and continued sending it? Or am I going to bring down the system? Nope, it just stops and, oh, that, that processor's dead. And I don't know if this, I know that this isn't just happening to me when I've tried it. You know, I've, I've seen this multiple places. I, I beat Stack Overflow. They added like another level, so I beat it again. Uh, <laughs> And so I have however many, like, tens of thousands of points there. And I'm on, uh, you know, the Python IRC. And, like, people walk in, and they have it. And, oh, why isn't this working? Oh, it just does that sometimes. Or, <laughs> you know. And the inevitable question that follows up is, what should I use instead? And that's, that's what's really insidious, is that it's trying to be a really general solution to a space that's really older than most of the stuff we do in computing. Uh, you know, parallel computing's been around for many a decade and has many mature solutions. Look, nothing like each other. Uh, Hadoop and MPI, you know, don't, don't share similar concepts, but solve parallel problems. And so I don't know the general answer to that question. But it turns out that, fortunately, when they show up at Stack Overflow, uh, they were using it because they thought the GIL would not let them have concurrent network connections. So easy answer then. Thank you. Sorry, me again. I saw that nobody wanted to come here. Um, I'm, I'm really astonished because a lot of people are sitting here and don't want to come on stage. Uh, I would like to ask people who like packaging to raise to like stand up, like everybody likes packaging, like really? <laughs> oh. What? Yeah, <laughs> he likes packaging. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so there are two things that I, I I would like to see that are better in packaging, especially uh, when you when you teach. Uh, it's really confusing for for students to understand the difference between when you are in the Python interpreter and when you are outside. And it would be really nice, for example, if I could tell a student, if you want to install a package, uh, just to import pip, pip.install string name of the package, and to be sure that it installed in the correct virtual environment or whatever, or if this thing wrap conda or something like that. So that basically you're sure to, for, for the student to do the, the, right, the exactly right thing. Uh, because I still have a lot of time and they're still trying to get this working. Um, I never, I can never remember how to upload upload the package on PyPI because, like, you need to uh, run the setup.py thing, which is complex, and you need to register the package. And can be, by the way, uh, oh, it works. Uh, I will sort of be, I'll be fast. Uh, when you upload Twine, you use, you have to use Twine because it uses uh, HTTPS, which is nice for security. But still, the package is still not registered. You're using HTTPS. You still need to do the register step uh, by hand, which is not nice for for for. For security, and this person here created a small package uh, creator, which is really nice. Um, you can go on PyPI, and it's called Flit. F L I T. I uh, invite you to um, to have a look at it. It's for wheels only. Uh, it's worked nice. I already wrote five packages in five days that I could upload in on PyPI in less than five minutes using um, using Flit. It gets rid of setup.py, which means that all the metadata and all the things are purely static and can be analyzed and you can do a lot of uh, nice nice things without executing code when um, when you install the, the package. So I don't know why you're still uh, sitting and it means that you love packaging but I, I think we can do better. And now I will leave place to the one who will do the real light, uh, lightning talks now that the uh, screen is working. All right, so we're going to do one last rant by Damon, and then uh, we'll do Philippe after that, and we'll go back to our regular scheduled lightning talks. I'm a little disappointed that I spent a lot of time contributing to this community, and the thing that people say to me is waffles. <laughs> like, some guy I didn't know came up to me on the first day of the conference and said, I introduced myself, oh, I don't think we've met. And he's like, no, we haven't, but waffles. <laughs> So I guess, yeah, that's fun. Um, what's the difference between an etymologist and an entomologist? 
The difference is an etymologist knows the difference. Thank you. So my talk is kind of a rant as well. Um, and I should be ranting actually about cables though. So who am I? Uh, my name is Felipe Fernandes, and you can find me on Twitter or GitHub as OCFPAF. And I'm going to tell about my love and hate story with Conda. And we have a problem. I mean, my boss came to me and said that we need a custom environment and consistent for all IUs people. And IUs is kind of big, and I didn't know that because I work remotely from Brazil, and my boss is here in the US. And when I realized how many people were going to actually be using our environment, I got scared. And then came the question, can Conda do it? Because he was kind of pushing Conda. And I like to think I'm a dedicated CIS administrator. Maybe not like that guy, but I'm kind of dedicated. So when my boss told me to consider using Conda, I said no. Basically because I need stable uh, software like PIP and virtual apps. And the idea of building a binary and upload it somewhere, somewhere else is, do is downloading that and using it, scares the hell off. You know, it's really scary. So I told him no way. And, of course, I was beating, I had to do it. There was no choice. Peep in virtual envy just doesn't work. So that's the story how I started the IU's Beanstar channel. Actually, now it's Anaconda channel. We have, right now, 107 packages. Actually, the channel has more packages than that. Those are the active uh, packages. Basically, every package that made it to the full channel, I remove it. Um, we have Linux, Windows, and OS X, which is great because we have a consistent environment throughout all platforms. Uh, we have some really hard to compile packages like Arius, NCO, GridGen. Like NCO is notoriously difficult if you're in the oceanographic community, you know that. Um, and now things are easy as code install NCO. So how we use it? Basically, that's it. You need those four lines. You add the you download. Uh, you add the channel, you download the requirement file, and install it in your environment. That's all we need to email our colleagues now. Um, here's how we're doing so far. We had almost 10,000 downloads overall. Most are Linux 64. I mean, nobody uses Linux 32 anymore. Uh, a lot of Windows users, though. And we have all the 107 packages for Linux and OS 10. Uh, Windows is lacking behind. There's still some difficulties in building some of the Windows packages especially because of NMake and CMake and all that mess on Windows. Why do guys still use Windows? Uh, I, I thought that was kind of a ranty. So how we do it? We put all the recipes on GitHub. We use App Failure to build the Windows automatically unloaded. We use Travis CI to upload to OS 10, and we use a Docker container to do for Linux. So it's kind of safe. It's better than compiling on my own machine and upload it. So all the CIs give us this illusion of safety. Um, <clears throat> but the truth is, forget about all that after PLs and stocks tomorrow, because it's probably going to introduce a better way of doing this. And basically, you can send a PR to a recipe. You can open issues saying, hey, update this package, or compile this package using those dependencies. So we, are, we manage our channel on GitHub. And how you can contribute, uh, improve the wiki, uh, report problems, request packages, or even better, send pull requests to our channel. And that's basically it. I mean, right now, because I'm using Travis and AppVare to do all the work, I can do a lot of off-the-chair sword fighting. Y'all are troopers. So uh, next up on deck is Jeff Freebach. You're on? Okay, great. Yep, perfect. And I hope this uh, emulates the sentiments of everybody here. Oh, come on. There we go. Finally. All right. So it is here. Other than the lightning talks, what is it? It is this book. 
So uh, Katie Huff and I wrote a book for O'Reilly called Effective Computation in Physics. It is finally, finally out. So, um, and what does this book contain, you might ask? Well, uh, it really, the whole idea behind this book was to take people from absolute beginner state to, um, to someone who knows just everything about the ecosystem. And in particular, it's a, it's a Python-based book. So we really start with how you open a terminal, and we go all the way up through learning Python, um, how you do things. Like, it, in, in particular, it's physics-based, quote unquote. Um, blame O'Reilly for the title. Um, uh, to doing analysis and visualization kind of work with NumPy and HDF5 and all, and all that fun stuff. Um, and how you use, how you test, how you debug, how you do all those things. And finally, how you use GitHub, how you publish papers, and how even to license the project. So it's very comprehensive. So if, you, if you've ever been wanting this kind of book, it now exists. And the only thing that's physics-y about it is the fact that some of the examples stem from, uh, fr from a physics background. So. Uh, you know, you don't need to know physics to, to actually read this book. Um, why did we write this book? Um, here's a confused squid. Um, just for us, this was a painful experience. Uh, that, that might be an understatement. So uh, I was talking to Wes actually at SciPy one year when he was writing his book. I was like, hey, how's it going? You know, we were in this stairwell down there. And he's like, it's terrible. It's harder than you even think it could possibly be. Um, never write a book. And that, that sort of conversation haunted me for the past year um, after I had stupidly signed a contract. Um, but why we did it was, was you. So uh, this book is really helpful, right? We have a lot of new people at this conference. We have a lot of new people who we want to bring into the scientific Python ecosystem or scientific computing in general. And it makes it just so much easier if you can point to a document that covers all of this stuff. So um, yeah, that's why we wrote it. Um, what? Yeah, it's, all, it's your fault completely. Yeah. Um, so uh, what, where can you find, the, find things out about this book? Uh, you can review it or buy it on Amazon or O'Reilly. Um, the website is just physics.codes. We stole that name very early. Um, then our, that's our Twitter handle and et cetera. So uh, please, please do that. And oh, sorry, there's one other slide. We sh definitely need to acknowledge uh, Software Carpentry and the Hacker Within. Um, this work was really heavily inspired by a lot of the Software Carpentry work and a lot of uh, the work that we did prior to that in in uh, in software or in in the hacker within, and uh, and this is us. We will be doing a book signing tomorrow during the during the break. So if you want a copy and you want to or you just want to haggle us and uh, that that's fine too. Come and come and see us tomorrow. So it's out finally. And uh, next up, sorry if you're not sick of me talking, is uh, Michael Zingo. You did yours, right. OK. Right as a rant. So after that, it's Randy Olson. You're around, Randy? OK, great. Right. So I'm going to do a little talk on um, something I just did, which was we released the Gill and Pandas. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Jeffrey Beck. I've been maintaining Pandas for the last few years, actually. Uh, as Wes likes to say, he gets all the kudos, I get the hate mail. So if you've ever had something immediately closed after you open it, you'll know who to blame. So, 
So everybody knows what the gill is, right? It's the global interpreter lock. That's it. Why do we care about this? So, of course, we care about this. Why? Because, you know, when we want to run things, say, uh, via threading, you know, the code will hold on to the lock, and therefore you can only run one a piece of code at a time. That's not good when you're trying to do things in parallel, because they end up running consecutively. Okay. So my motivation was actually uh, from the developers of Dask. They were like, hey, Scikit Image did it, so you can too. So we did actually. It, it, it was actually much more complicated than their um, solution. Um, basically, in, in a lot of the Scython code, we actually released the gill now. Um, and I'm here's a little mini demo. Sorry. By the way, this is, uh, I'll just go back here a second. This is on GitHub, just you know, in case you want to see this notebook. So here's a little mini demo. Let's do this. This requires master, actually. So this will be in the next version of Pandas, maybe in a month or two. Something like that. Uh, so, it, and it's only for some of the functions at this point, uh, mainly for group buys, but these are the um, kind of the interesting ones. So, we'll create a little data frame. Great. This is what it looks like a standard group buy. Um, everybody probably does that. And then my little test functions to show you how this works. This test peril is stolen from Scikit Image as well. Um, I always recommend stealing code, it makes you feel good. So we'll do that. So the, we'll just do a little time it here. Ooh, 22 milliseconds, awesome. So now I'm gonna simulate using a single thread by running it twice. And as you would expect, these things scale linearly. Awesome. Means you can get the same amount of work done no matter how hard you try, okay. Then we're gonna simulate uh, using multi-threads and wow, it actually works. Here's my little results. Get a nice little pretty graph. Um, the comparison in the multi-thread and the single threads. And then we get speed ups. Now the interesting point here is actually you can get uh, more work done utilizing more cores. In other words, this graph has a little bit upward sloping, which is awesome actually. Um, just some just anecdotal testing. Um, you can basically, this is of course just using threading, you can get you know two to four times speed up. So it's just actually pretty nice. And it's sort of for free now. James. Is that a benchmark? <laughs> this benchmark is not well defined. So that's your answer. So that's it. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, we'll next have uh, Randy Chen up, I believe. Are you in the room? Yep, okay, and that will be our last lightning talk of the day, so. Uh-oh. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Hi, right. what's going on? Is it working? There we go, okay. Hi, everyone, I'm Randy Olson, and uh, I first want to do a little survey. Who here uses Twitter? Right, raise a hand. Keep your hand up if you use Twitter way too much. Yeah, me too. So I found myself in this situation about a, a year and a half ago where I was spending way too much time on Twitter. It was getting in the way in, in, of my PhD. And you know, I thought, hey, I use Python to automate practically everything. Why don't I automate Twitter and the things I do on there? So I put together a little Python package. And, uh, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, one neat little feature and one experiment I've been running for the past year and a half. Um, and this will perhaps explain why most people I've met here, uh, when, they, when we introduce ourselves, they go, oh yeah, I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> um, so the experiment that I started running about a year and a half ago was I wanted to see, is it, auto, is it possible to automatically build your Twitter, your Twitter following without having to do anything at all? You know, just use Twitter as you normally do and let Python build it for you. So that's what, that's when I built this little thing that I call the Twitter follow bot. If you look through my repos, I'm really not creative with my repo name. So that's about as creative as I get. And it's super easy to use. Um, you can actually pip install this. Uh, and, and it has several built-in functions. So you sort of instantiate the bot and then you give it things like uh, follow people that tweet about hashtag Python 
or hashtag machine learning or various other things that you're interested in. They can be phrases, it's whatever you use, or it, it, whatever you pull up in the search function on Twitter, it will look up people on there and follow them. It has other features too, like uh, if you follow people and some of them are not interested in you and they don't follow back, it can automatically unfollow them and add them to a list and not bother them again. Uh, if, if, you know, because you don't want to annoy people with, by following them over and over again. Um, and then also you can favorite tweets. So if you run a blog or something like that and, you know, you want to raise, you want to let people know, hey, I saw your tweet, I saw your tweet, you know, <laughs> come check me out, um, you can do that too. Very similar interface as the follow thing. So for the past year and a half, I've been doing this. On my server, I had a cron job running and I basically followed as many people as I could related to Python and machine learning and all these things and until the Twitter API said, all right, stop. And I said, okay, I'll stop for eight hours and I'll go at it again. <laughs> so I noticed some really interesting things, particularly that consistently across several accounts about 10% of the people that you cold follow, as in people you don't know that you follow, will follow you back. And it's really interesting um, because, you know, I've done this on my girlfriend's account now and you get the exact same percentage. I, I don't know, it's some rule, weird rule of Twitter. But anyway, um, and so, but of course eventually you're going to hit a point where you can't follow people anymore. So then you just kind of clear up your follow queue and you, and you do this unfollow routine every other day. You know, give people some time to react. Presumably people will check their Twitter at least once in a 48 hour period. Uh, so. Of course, we want to ask, okay, well, did it work? Well, a year and a half later, here's my account. I'm sitting at about 57,000 followers. Uh, and I obviously, you can tell what actions are automated and what actions aren't automated. You know, the favorites and everything are in the thousands. I don't tweet that much. <laughs> and then I'm running another account here uh, that also built up similar numbers, although not quite as popular. I don't know about the variation. I need to do a proper experiment on it, I guess. And according to some vague metrics, you know, that Clout and various other websites rate these accounts on, they say that I'm among the most influential accounts on Twitter. So cool, <laughs> thanks to Python, I'm one of the most influential accounts on Twitter, yay. Okay, so uh, during the conference, uh, we were talking about other things that could be done with bots like this over Twitter, of course. Uh, who talks in person nowadays, right? Anyway, uh, and we thought about, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could start detecting spammers with this bot, you know? So one neat feature about this bot is that it tends to get a lot of spammers to follow you and try to spam you. So it's pretty easy to, de to detect them and then report them to Twitter and get them off of Twitter so we can have a cleaner Twitter where we have real people using bots to follow each other and fake interact. <laughs> Anyway, um, so this is all on, this is on PyPy, so you can pip install it. There's a GitHub link right there, and there's my Twitter handle if you want to reach out to me. Um, other than that, thanks. Thanks. I'm glad we finally removed the humans from Twitter. Um, all right, Daniel. <laughs> and from the audience, apparently. Did it work? Ooh, did something. It's on my other monitor. Okay. All right. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Daniel. Um, I'm a graduate student at Virginia Tech in the Genetics, Bioinformatics, and Computational Biology program. Um, it's part of the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute, and I'm currently in the Social and Decision Analytics Lab, and lastly, I'm also one of the many software carpentry instructors here in this conference. So I'm here to teach you about literate programming, or how to write a book. So what is literate programming? Um, it's a way to interweave code with regular prose text. And first, my first exposure to this was in R and R Studio. 
uh, using Knitter, R Markdown, and S Weave. And we, during this conference, you hear a lot about the Jupyter Notebook, and that is one way you can do literate programming. You can have your Markdown cells and your code cells. But I sort of wanted an interface that I knew coming from the R world, and particularly, I wanted to be able to use uh, LaTeX. And I wanted to be able to write my documents and so it's not you know, 20,000 lines in one document. I wanted to be able to split this out. And I wanted to have something like cross-referencing. And so one package that I found um, that I sort of taught myself over the past 12 hours uh, was, this was this package called PWeave, which is similar to SWeave and R. And so I'm here to give you a quick demo of what I learned in the past 12 hours. So. Um, PWeave and SWeave, they're both uh, LaTeX documents, so you have your regular preamble um, in, your, in your LaTeX file. Um, just know that you have to name it .pnw um, instead of .tech, or if you're coming from the R world, it's, it, the R way of writing it would be SNW. Um, and you just write your regular LaTeX as if it was nothing really special. Um, I added this package called standalone, and what this lets me do is I can sort of write my chapters in separate files. Uh, so I, again, I don't have 20,000 lines in one document to go scroll through. And really, nothing really that special um, in terms of LaTeX, but if you want to enter, have your Python code, it's really this two less than signs, two greater than signs, an equal, and then an at. And everything in between is just your regular Python code, and it will execute. Um, as is, and if you want to show the results, you can say that um, just tell PWeave to render this somehow using restructured text, and it will show the result and execute the code. And so you sort of get, um, you know, sort of like the Jupyter Notebook, except in my opinion, you can be a little, you can do a little more stuff with it. Um, so um, let's say, for example, I wanted to split this file out into multiple files. Um, this is where the standalone package came from, um, comes in, and you can, for example, where is it? Uh, using the standalone, you can simply say input child, and that is just regular LaTeX uh, way of incorporating other tech files. And on the top right here, that is an example of um, another child document, so if you have multiple chapters, you can write your chapters in separate files. And the only thing special about this file is instead of a regular preamble, your document class is now standalone. And uh, the way you run this, I have my poor man's make file. Uh, you call pweave-f tech and then the, uh, tech, the PNW file that you want to render. And so I sort of just rendered my child documents first before I rendered my master one. And then I run PDF LaTeX, and then I can open my file. And so, let's run this. And you get your whatever document class you want. So this is my title, um, everything I put in. Uh, because it's, I put it in book format, I have it in this form. And that's, that's time, but yes, that's it. Um, the code is... It's on GitHub, so you guys can go check it out. Thank you so much, Daniel. <laughs> and thanks to everybody for sticking around through our technical difficulties slash rants. <laughs>